Uh, yeah, thank you for being here with us this morning. We're talking about the book of Acts. We're talking about this great movement of God that 2,000 years ago he created. And I love um, when we look at it. We've seen over the past weeks, Brent and I have been sharing with you, uh, he can't be stopped. Nothing has stopped him so far. He's created this movement. It's turned into something big. Opposition comes right away, externally and internally in the lives of people. Um, but nothing can stop it. In fact, last week it was interesting from Gamaliel, one of those prophetic things that he said that he didn't even realize was this, that if it is God, um, we can't stop it. Now he assumed it wasn't and it would just fall apart, but here we are 2,000 years later. Um, one of the things that I reflected on this week, heading towards this and kind of giving a little background and, and thinking about it too, is that... God does not want us to just survive, like even the pandemic or different aspects, you know, of all that we've been going through. There can be this element for us, like if we could just survive it. I think a lot of that happened and is still happening in the church. A lot of things came forward and came up according to, you know, um, um, like, can we make this? Can we make it through this? And so there's this survival element. But the deal is, God, he doesn't want us just to survive. He wants us to thrive through all of it. This shouldn't stop us. If he can't be stopped, this shouldn't stop us either. And so in light of that, where we're going today is a little bit about mission and staying on course and thriving, not just surviving. Now, I want to give a little background because we're going to move into some different sections of Acts. And I want you to think about something with me in it all. Concerning Acts, this will be one of those, hey, what about our, uh, our um, like, teaching and study on our own? This will help you in that. And that is this, that Acts, the book of Acts, is descriptive, not prescriptive. And this will matter in just a moment with the things that I'm going to say. It's telling God's story. It's really almost telling our story a little bit, and it's describing something. But when we look at certain patterns and perspectives in the book of Acts, it's not prescriptive, meaning this isn't, this isn't necessarily how you are supposed to do it, and if you don't do it this way, you're bad or wrong, or that's why it's not working out. That comes into play a lot with the church, because a lot of times you'll hear like, we just need to go back to the Acts chapter 2, 3, 1, whatever, church. And I'm like, well... Yes and no, we're not living in Jerusalem at Solomon's colonnade. We're not, it's not the same. There's great perspectives there, great principles to learn. It's showing us the big ideas. But it's not showing us this perfect pattern of how it's supposed to be. And that's going to come out today too because we're going to look at neglect and needs a little bit and see where we need to engage in things. And if we're not careful, we just take that as the prescription for all the answers to our problems and we say it's supposed to be that way. And that's not necessarily true. Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive. But it does have great principles there. So again, it's not the picture of a perfect pattern that we're to follow. We must, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, a little deeper, we must stay with God's purposes and plans and yet we can innovate we can adapt, we have to be creative at times and flexible while staying 100% on the mission of God. And that's important for us to remember because some of the things we do, we will not necessarily like, but it matters for mission. We may try things and it doesn't work, but we continue to stay on mission. The other thing that I want you to remember with Acts being Descriptive, not pre, pre, pre <laughs> You know the word. Okay. It's not a picture of the perfect church either. we got to be careful in the book of Acts because a lot of times we'll think there's the perfect church. We need to act like that. But here's the problem. We've seen it over the past couple weeks at times. We can see it again today. The church is filled with imperfect people. We're going to make mistakes we're going to do some things wrong. We're going to have to readjust. We're going to have to repent. Praise God for following and serving a perfect God, Jesus. The book of Acts, it's not the perfect church. It's describing some things to us. It's sharing with us the work of God. 
but it's not always the perfect picture of how it's supposed to be. And that frees us up to be able to do the things that God is calling us to do while staying on mission. Now, here's where we go today. A lot of times what happens is we get off mission very easily. This is business, this is church, this is even family and people personally. This happens very easily. It's easy to get off course. This can happen rapidly. We'll see that today in the story that we're looking at. Go to Acts chapter 6 to prep there. We're only looking at the first seven verses. If you're online or in person, go to your you know, iPads or phones or Bibles, whatever you got in whatever form, go there. This can happen rapidly or it can also happen slow getting off mission where we don't even see it really happening. Now, there's a rule in navigation. I'm not real familiar with this. I just learned it this week. It's the one in 60 rule. Um, I have some friends that fly, and I'll share with you some of my limited sailing experience. But the one in 60 rule in navigation is this, that every one degree, for example, a plane veers off its course, it misses its target destination by one mile for every 60 miles. That's just by one degree. So if you fly to California, hundreds of miles, if you fly to Israel, thousands of miles, can you imagine even just one degree off how many miles you would be off course, you would not hit your target? I remember flying, um, this was years ago, um, when I was at Table Rock, one of the pastors there, and a guy in the church had a plane, and a couple times I went with him up north. We went up to uh, Newport, Oregon, Flew in there, ate there, hung out there, did some things around town, you know, went to the beach, stuff like that, got back in the plane and came back and we're flying down the coast and then we're going to cut over and, and head to Medford. He tells me when we're heading down the coast, hey, Ron, because I was sitting on the front with him, um, co-piloting, you know, which meant I'm just looking out the window watching him do what he does. And he says, do you want to take the, the wheel? You want to, you want to take the, the controls? And I'm looking, are you, you're crazy, man. You know me. You do not want to do this. But I'm like, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> of course I will. It took me just seconds. I grab those controls. I'm asking them some things, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I've already told you this many times, I can be all over the place. Squirrels, there's Jesus in a cloud. Look at that beat. Look at that. Do you see that? It just took seconds for me to be off course and potentially taking us down. I could have never made it home, whether I could see the destination or not. Very easy. It took just moments when I became the pilot and he's supposed to be the pilot. The moment I took the wheel from him, everything changed. He did not let me have it much longer and he did not offer me to take it again. I've sailed twice. I mean, I've done some other little boating things a bunch of times, but I've actually gone from Newport Harbor in California to Catalina a couple times. One, you've heard the story that I'll tell you in just a moment. I'm not going to tell the whole story. One in a sailboat, one in a cabin cruiser. One of the teachers at SCC, which is now Vanguard, um, was part of this club down in Newport, and he would take some of us sailing with him once in a while, and we went to Catalina, spent the night. It was awesome. We did it on the sailboat. It was incredible. Um, spent time there, hung out there, sailed back. The cabin cruiser time, we went to Catalina, and again, some of you have heard this. I won't go into the details, but we got there. It was great, and we're ready to leave. We got to get back. I don't remember if he had to go, you know, teach classes. We had to uh, go to classes as well, all that kind of stuff, but... Um, we start heading back. Now there's a storm coming, and he's a little worried that we shouldn't go at the time. And it's only 32 miles approximately from Catalina to Newport Bay. It's not that far. But partway into it, storm came in. It got out of control, so much so that he is horrified. He's telling us, get our life jackets on. You know, he's just, I got a picture of him. I've showed the church in the past when I've shared the story. He is just gripped to the wheel. You could see fear in his face, which created fear in a lot of us. And then he calls the Coast Guard and asks Mayday, all this crazy stuff. And we're like, what's going on? It doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. But his biggest problem was this. The wind and the waves were pushing us so hard that it wasn't just one degree off course. I don't know how far we are, but basically we were going to end up in South America if we didn't get help. 
Now, I would have loved that. I don't know if we were fully stocked with food, but he called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard cutter came, came right up alongside us. I got a picture of the Coast Guard cutter coming towards us and then got, led us all the way in to Newport Harbor by cutting the wind and the waves to get us to where we needed to be. We were way off course. Just that 32 miles, that little bit was going to put us way out of range, way off course. The story today in Acts chapter 6 really has a lot to do with a community of people potentially getting off mission and them getting back on very quick, quickly. But I want to talk a little bit about that today, mission drift for us. And that's important for a church. We're nine years old. We're heading towards 10. We're still babies in a lot of ways. We've made it through, well, almost through a pandemic and a move at the same time. And a lot of other things going on. There's a lot happening. Praise God that he's bringing us through. A bunch of imperfect people gathering together to follow him. But I'm concerned, maybe it's, because I'm one of the leaders, about being off mission, off course. Letting other things dictate our direction. There's a lot behind this, and it matters for you as well as people of God. It's so easy to get off course. Let's look at the story. It's Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It says this, and we've seen this all the way through chapter 5. Despite opposition, despite all that's going on, despite, despite loss of life, the internal and external going on in the church at that time, despite, listen to this, they didn't even have a building. They met on some steps at the temple. Despite all going on, we have learned so far that they've grown rapidly, and that continues. Verse 1, chapter 6. Of Acts, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, this is what comes up every time in a church. There were rumblings of discontent. That is church 101, man, right there. It happens. It happens at every church. It happens in business. It happens even in family at time. This can be applied in many ways. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers. So instantly there's even some discontent and brokenness happening, saying that their widows were being discriminated against. Some translations will say neglect was happening. They were being neglected. Discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. This is a common thing that they would do. It reflects back to Acts chapter 4 when it said that there was no needs in the church because everybody just brought what they had and gave it away to those in need. But suddenly we see it breaking down a little bit. Rapid growth, man, separations happening. And so, hey, listen, there's a problem. It's brought to the attention of the leadership that the daily distribution of food is not happening And that it's not happening to all people the way it should. So the 12, we knew there was the 12 leaders of the church at that time, called a meeting of all the believers. Hey, let's all get together. I kind of like that it's not a committee. Let's put a committee together and spend the next three years figuring out how we're going to distribute food properly. That's typically what often happens. They just call a meeting of all the believers, and they said, We apostles, we leaders, should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. At first, feels a little like some tension there. But we'll talk about that in a little bit, because every part matters. You all matter. And they say, so brothers, let's select seven men who are well-respected, full of the spirit and full of wisdom. And what we'll do is we'll give them this responsibility. The church is growing rapidly. There obviously is a problem that we've neglected. So let's bring some men together. Let's make sure they have some qualities and qualifications that we think are important. And let's give them that responsibility to take care of. 
then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Well, everyone liked this idea. That sounds great. So they chose the following. And I kind of like that they named these men and they talked about them a little bit and it was important to them and, and it was important to them because the people were important to them and what was happening was important to them. Again, it mattered. So this is going to make a difference. And they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about him over the next couple of weeks. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven men were presented to the apostles. They prayed for them, and they laid their hands on them, and that's a sign of authority to say, hey, we give you authority to do what we've called you to do. So, in light of that, it says God's message continued to spread, and the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were even converted as well. That's a big deal. In light of what they just did, God continued to work. Like This mattered. It made a difference. Rapid multiplication, or even slow growth for that matter, can bring a relaxed mission. Suddenly, we look at other things instead of the importance of what God wants to do and stay on mission in it. That can lead, as we saw in the story, but it has not changed for 2,000 years, that can lead to rumblings of discontent, discontent, discrimination, and neglect. And again, we saw earlier in chapter 4, hey, listen, there was no needy among them, and suddenly, here's what's going on, this is... How important it is, neglect happens, rumblings occur, and we see that breaking down. So this matters. This makes a difference moving forward in the church. Now let me just talk about this for a moment. How does mission drift, we'll call it, happen in the church? Now, there's a lot in your small groups that you can talk about. You can look at this personally. You can think about this at home or in various aspects, really in your business as well or your jobs. How does mission drift happen in the church? How do we get so easily sidetracked? One, this was important for me this week because of the building. Every week I walk in here and see what's not done. And I want to tell you every week, and it's almost can become guilt and shame, and some of you have put a lot of money into seeing seeing the work get done, and then I feel hesitant to go, and we need more money to get it done. I don't like it. It's just the truth, though. But we're closer. What was this massive amount is now trimmed down again a little more to about 17,000 to finish out this room, to get the lights working properly, And it just all costs money. But here's the deal. And then we haven't even tackled the room and there's kids stuff to buy and youth and lobby and people come and go, hey, are we going to make this pretty? We're going to do that? We're going to do that? I'm like, yeah, it's on the docket, man. It's just that cash thing. And then you have this guilt and, you know, all this stuff is just this tension in there, right? Mission drift happens when the building becomes more important than the mission. And to be honest with you, sometimes that terrifies me. I struggle with that. We want, we have two big missions. More people to find Jesus. I believe in him so much that this matters to me. This building isn't gonna be for everybody. Some people aren't gonna like the preachers. You're not going to like the worship. We hear it all. Too loud, too soft, too many colors, too this, too that, too this, too that. Rumblings of discontent constantly. And I'll come to this in a moment. Man, I'm a people pleaser. But could you imagine how easy it would be to get off track if I try to please all the people? It's impossible. Right? But if the building becomes more important than people finding Jesus... And those that have found him are formed by him, then we're off base. 
We are off mission, period. But it comes with great tension. This is a resource. Resources are used for mission. Not for run, not so we look better than another church and attract more people because of the building. That'll happen sometimes, but that's not a mission unless you declare that it is, and I am declaring that it is not. We get off mission when that happens, mission drift, and that can be slow and steady. Do we need more money? Yes, but it's so that more people can find Jesus and be formed by him into the likeness of him. Sometimes mission drift happens when we neglect one person or thing over the other. Sometimes this even happens, we neglect it because we look at things as secular and sacred. Like that tension in that story is this, like a pastor going, I just need to pray and preach the word and I need the rest of you to go clean the toilets. (laughs) So suddenly we look at, like what if all that's to help people find Jesus? and be formed to the likeness of him. If that's true, then everything is sacred. Your jobs, what you do, how you do it, those things matter to people. There are even opportunities we've talked about. Mission drift happens too when we lose touch with who we are to be serving. Sometimes, I don't know what the real needs are, are out there in the world around me. Sometimes I don't even know the people behind those needs. And mission drift can happen when I perceive something to be something or someone that it's not. Mission drift can happen, and I already mentioned this, when the leadership, and I'm the biggest probably leader in some ways, in some perspectives, um, and people pleasing becomes a bigger issue. Mission drift easily happens then because now I am navigating towards people that I want to be, I want to make you happy. It is impossible to make a room of people all happy. Now I will try my hardest (laughs) and I will fail every time. But when I do that, mission drift happens. I get off course We see it, of course, we've talked about it, opposition and persecution. We see it happen when we become, like the story, overburdened and overextended in our lives. Some of you experience that in your jobs, in your homes, in your relationships. We do it here at church. You realize later, I have just overextended myself. I cannot continue this path and stay healthy and stay on mission in business, church, life, whatever it is, personally, it, it's going to destroy us. When we overburden volunteers, we don't need more kids volunteers just because we want kids volunteers. We want more kids to find Jesus, be formed by him, so we want healthy people in there. That means we can't burden down the people every Sunday with the same people doing the same thing over and over again. That means I don't guilt you into it and say, if you don't, Serve in the kids' ministry, more children are going to go to hell, and it's your fault unless you serve. That's called shame and guilt, and that is being off mission. But if you believe in what you do and that it matters, then maybe you do want to volunteer, or you find a place that fits for you, or you just live that kind of life at your job, in your neighborhood. But when we overburden, overextend ourselves and our leaders and volunteers, we then lack this ministry of delegation and opportunity for people to serve with their giftings and in their relationships and strengths. And then there's this last one, and there's more that you can talk about in your small groups or on your own or contemplate and think about yourself. Sometimes a church, we have no purpose But even worse, we have different purposes. So in a room or a business, when there is a bunch of people, you know, if there's 50 people here today and another 50 online or however that is, can you imagine if we all have a different purpose for the church? Can you imagine when two people are walking along, what that looks like if we're even just one degree apart going a different direction? As we continue to go forward, we get farther apart. 
and it causes missions drift. Okay? And when all of that happens, when those types of things occur, when we do this, the results can be our priorities are off. We can, we can see often a personal failure. In, for, as a leader, this is where my integrity gets compromised. When I know the right thing to do, but because I want to please people or do my own thing or have people serve me, my integrity gets compromised and I'm off mission. This is where disunity sets in. And this is where we become inefficient and ineffective in the things that God has called us to. But here we go. Here's just the principles for today. Five things that matter. Big ideas. You can delve a little deeper, all right, for us to look at today. How do I stay on mission? How does a church stay on mission? And here, here they are. Number one, in the story we see it, in our lives it matters. Play your part. What you do matters. Every one of you. You make a difference. I say it all the time. You hear me say it all the time. You matter and make a difference. Play your part, whatever that part is. You can look through the entire story of God. I was reading through Numbers recently, and you saw how each tribe camped around the temple that, that were responsible for the temple, and they all had a part to play, a place to be. And if one tribe didn't play their part, it really messed up the entire system, the entire thing that God was doing. Things wouldn't be picked up, right? They couldn't follow God properly. They couldn't do things properly if they didn't put it back together in the right way. There was a system and a plan that God had created. And the tribes, even where they camp, they had different roles, responsibilities. You saw in the building of the temple and other places in the Old Testament how people had giftings, artistic work that they did, writing, all, all the beauty of God's kingdom coming together in multiple creative ways. And it all mattered and made a difference because everybody played their part. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 is a great chapter to read, but I'm only going to read a couple verses. 1 Corinthians 12, this is 18 and 27. Now, he's talking about Paul is to the church, the body, all these parts, why it matters. I mean, it's a beautiful chapter. Read it. And part of it, he says, our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part where he wants it. Like, I need you to do your part. I shouldn't play your part, and you shouldn't try to play mine. And when we do our parts, play our roles or responsibilities or use our giftings and relationships, it's going to make a bigger difference than it ever could if I tried to do it all myself. That's when it falls apart. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. All of you together, man, that's a great circle, highlight it, underline it, our Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. You matter. You make a difference. I love Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation, it's not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. <laughs> That's really where mission will fall apart as well. When I think I did it, or I did the good, or I take you know, ownership of it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. And here it is, so we can do the good things he planned for us, for you, for me, long ago. I want to encourage you to play your part. Now, this is a whole study, multiple series, but use your skills, gifts, relationships, you. Because you are a part of the body, and you matter and make a difference. So number one, play your part. Number two, hey, meet a need. This is very simple there were needs there. I wonder if you would evaluate what are the needs and priorities around me. We want to do that as a church. And then as a leadership, we represent you in so many ways, missionally around the world, locally in a lot of missions activity. But you also do that yourself. Maybe you can look at and say, 
hey, I want to be on mission so that more people find Jesus, and I want to be formed by him, and I want more people, you know, to experience that as well. So one of the ways that that happens is when we meet the needs of people. When we look at all things matter, I said earlier, and we don't look at sacred and secular. We just look at, and this is all God's. Let's meet the needs of people. I wonder what needs and priorities are around you. I've been trying to look more and more at my neighborhood. What are the needs in my neighborhood? Like these people, I want them to know Jesus. I wonder what needs are there that, that I could meet. As a church, like even being here at the school has offered us more opportunities to meet the needs of people. But we need it to really fit under the mission of God, otherwise we get off track. So here's number three, but it goes with number two, and it's this. Care for the people behind the need. I think we get off mission if we just try to meet needs, but forget about the people behind the need. They matter and make a difference. I shared that a little bit in a different way with the people yesterday at the service, the memorial service. Right here. Try to look past what's going on to the depth of the pain and hurt that some of them are going through. And it was different for different people. I wonder if we look at needs to stay on mission, we also have in our minds that we need to care for the people behind the need. So it wasn't just, in the story, food distribution. There was also two different categories or groups of people that had specific needs. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, to the religious leaders, hey, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. One is there's a money thing. Hey, that's important, yes. But you're missing the bigger thing, justice, mercy, faith. You should tithe, yes, Jesus said, but do not neglect the more important things. For me, that's the people behind the need. It's not sometimes just about giving money to somebody. I want to take time to hear their heart, see what's going on. James 1.27 reflects on that a little bit more when it says pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. It's the people behind that that matter. We need to learn to care for the needs of people behind those needs. Who are we neglecting in light of our mission? I wonder if you'd evaluate your life, your community, and we need to do that as a church constantly. Is there anybody that we are neglecting in light of our mission for more people to find Jesus and be formed by him into the likeness of him? Ministry of word we see in this story and table are both important. What I do is important. What you do is important. Let's do it together. All aspects of the body are important. You might even ask yourself a question today, who are the modern day orphans and widows? And one answer is orphans and widows. <laughs> but there's also people that may fit into that category that we neglect sometimes. The fourth thing is this, in light of all that, it's the simple word delegate. I believe that we need to constantly be reminded that we are part of something bigger than just you and me. We're part of the church, and it's not just journey. We're part of a bigger mission that Jesus declared to the church. My answer for that and my encouragement to you is don't go it alone. Sometimes I've hurt myself, sometimes even physically and emotionally and spiritually, when I try to do it myself, I'm 57 now. And there are times 
when I think that I'm 25, so I try to lift that, do that, kick that, run that way, and suddenly I realize, oh, I can't do that anymore. But it's not even that. I shouldn't do that anymore. I need to ask for help. This is a problem for me. It's a problem in the church. I have been guilty of this so many times, of just doing it myself. I see a need, I just do it. But that's a selfish thing, because I haven't asked for help, and I should. We should, in all of this, be empowering people more than complaining about the problem. And man, sometimes I'm a great complainer. (laughs) And I'm not the best empowerer of people. And when that happens, we get off mission. For someone like me, a whole church can get off mission because of that. So let me give you just before the fifth thing, real quick, some things that we need to do better as a church that we need to be reminded of as a church, and maybe it even fits for your business or yourself personally. One, as we grow and come back and in a new place, doing some new things, we need to organize ourselves to stay on mission. So sometimes we may make some decisions that keep us organized because rapid growth or slow growth, for that matter, right, can really get us off track if we're not careful. So we organize things to stay on mission. That means we calibrate and calculate. That's even scripture where we calculate the cost before we enter into it. Calibrate and calculate to a point of reference so that we stay focused on that reference and for us it's Jesus. Two, as we organize and we do that in the beginning and we continue to do that, there are often times when we need to reorganize when we get off course. This is recalibrating. This is recalculating. It's like the GPS. You probably do it all the time. Getting lost anymore isn't the best excuse on the reason you're late. Like that used to be perfect for us. Why, why, did, you know, why are you late, man? Well, you didn't give me good directions. I got lost. Did you use your phone? Nowadays, there's not really that much of an excuse, right? Because it's constantly like if you have it on your speaker, it's like recalculating, you know, and it'll just like... You can get right back there. It'll take you right around. Often we need to do this reorganizing when we get off course. Can you imagine, too, even if it's a slow process for some of you, concerning things in life that's been a struggle for you, I don't, I don't want to give you an excuse, but what if one degree gets us off course as we move forward the wrong way? What if you even were able to go one degree towards the right direction to get back on course? That would even change things. I mean, it's better if you can do more. And then we evaluate constantly, consistently, take inventory on mission, where we at, needs, neglect. It's not a place to, to, you know, make blame and shame on somebody. The deal as much as putting more effort into fixing the problem. And this applies personally and as a church. But here's my wrap up. The worship team can come. And then we're going to sing. If you have communion online, in person, it's a time you can take communion. Remember the greatness of Jesus in it all. And then uh, I'll come and pray and, and send this out. It's one of my favorite verses. I constantly come back to it. This is from the message. But it's this, offer yourself to God, Romans 12, 1. This is really the beginning place, not just for a church. That's important, Yes. Your business, that's important, yes. Family, relationships, yes. But what if it just started with you? So if what you do and who you are matters, like if you know the Enneagram, you're in here, all numbers matter. One number isn't better than the other. I mean, that's just different personalities, you matter and make a difference to God and to the community and to the church. Here's your starting place, wherever you're at. What if you offered yourself to God today? 
Because if you go back up, you might go, well, I'm not perfect. I haven't done the right things. I'm struggling. I don't know. My faith is weak. Whatever it is, my encouragement is just offer yourself to God. Start there. That may be, I think that's bigger than one degree, your step back towards him if you're off course. Romans 12, 1 from the message. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. What if that, today, is your move back to God? And I encourage you, that's always a move back to God. If you are having mission drift in your personal life, then the start today is offer yourself to God. And Lord, we do that today. I declare, Lord, that often I get off mission. I drift from you, apart, away from. Even that one degree a little bit eventually gets me further away till suddenly by the power of your Holy Spirit, you kind of pull me back in, draw me back in through creative ways, through a worship song, through somebody else. And, and so Lord, today, even along with everybody else online and in person, I just want to offer myself to you. Every part of my life, the ordinary parts, all parts, God, it, it matters to you. So we just open up our hearts to where you want to work, what you want to do. For those that feel far from God, Lord, we want them to find you and come back to you. Maybe today they take a step closer, you know, a step um, more towards you in some way. Lord, as a church, help us to stay on task, on mission, so that more people can find you and be formed into the likeness of you. And wouldn't we need to reorganize, guys, reorganize and, and recalculate and recalibrate and help us to do it even, it's a hard part for me when it's hard, Lord, when it takes some restructuring. And thank you, during this song, we, we let it speak to our hearts and some of us will take communion and remember that Jesus, you pursued us. You always were stepping towards us. That you stayed on mission no matter what. The opposition, the pain, the suffering, the struggle. Man, you stayed focused because you loved us. So much so that you would go to the cross and die for our sin so that we could truly live the life that you declared we could have and live. So thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's sing. Take communion if you have it and you'd like. I'm online in person here. And then after the song, I'll come back and, and send us off with a prayer and blessing.